partner today is Dr. N. Le Lim Go. Um, Dr. Go is the Chief Technology Officer at SGI. Dr. Go received his PhD from Birmingham University in England. The title of Dr. Go's talk today is a new platform to complement, I'm reading off of here now yeah. rather than the program, a new platform to complement the discovery process. So let's welcome Thank Dr. You. Go to the um, platform. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, before I start, I think uh, I've been at this conference uh, almost uh, 10 years now. And I think it is appropriate on this 25th anniversary for me to, to say uh, some words of appreciation to John. Uh, I've always, uh, in the 10 years, uh, known you to be a gentleman, smart, uh, and creative. So and, and, uh, it's a privilege uh, to, to have worked with you all these uh, last 10 years, and hope uh, many more. Right? On that note, uh, please uh, help me join. Uh, give applause to John. Yes, I'm here uh, today uh, to give a talk about uh, a digital laboratory uh, at scale. Uh, basically, uh, we have started shipping this new platform uh, to complement the discovery, the engineering process for about 10 months now. And we have uh, shipped something like 200 systems of such, um, and uh, about 100 of them are large scale. And, and we've been getting, start, getting early feedback, but not enough feedback yet, but early feedback so I thought uh, I'll uh, give you some insights uh, as to those feedback uh, in this conference. Basically, if, uh, if you take one example uh, of a University of Montreal, uh, RQCHP of a human heart model, I picked this one because uh, it is closest, uh, uh, most easy, easy, uh, easily understood and uh, unclassified. So Mark Botsy started out uh, with a plan uh, to, to build a digital heart uh, with two billion grid points. But he started his uh, code development uh, on an experimental basis on his laptop uh, with 60 million grid points. And then the next thing he needed to do was to move up uh, his experiment from 60 million grid points to 2 billion. Why 2 billion? He estimated that at 2 billion grid points, the electrical signal propagation across that 2 billion grid points of the representation of the human heart would be an accurate, a very close accurate uh, representation of a uh, ECG uh, that is actually on the surface of the heart. To do that, you actually thread a, uh, a probe through a vein on your leg into the inside of the heart to measure it. So uh, this, the process it took is as follows. With 60 million grid points, um, the domain scientist, which is Mark Potsy himself, uh, develops his code. It's typically C-based. It's subscale. It is not 2 billion grid points. It's 60 million only. Uh, the reason he chose 60 million, probably, I, I need to ask him, but probably because it fit into the memory he had on his uh, PC or workstation. And it is e essentially running on a PC or a single uh, one node on the cluster. The next step he needed to do to scale up uh, was to uh, uh, employ a, or get the help of a computational engineer uh, to, po to port uh, this code yeah, and to MPI so that you can do at scale 2 billion grid points and then run it on a cluster. Um, I just use an example of an MPP system cluster, uh, NASA system up there, that's of the order of 100,000 cores. Not that both of them are related, but I thought I'd just bring up the bigger system up there. So that was the pro usual process, the current process. The only issue is that this process of moving the code over to MPI as he was developing his code, right, new code, uh, took either days, weeks, or months. That was the issue he needed to solve. Because sometimes he couldn't wait a month. Why? Because next month he needs to publish his paper. So he needed to at least run something at scale uh, to, to verify that uh, the findings in his papers are correct. So what did he do? Uh, basically, this is the new platform we're introducing that will complement the entire process that comes in the middle. They essentially, it is a big PC that just have enough memory uh, to let you run your original experimental code at scale. That essentially is an uh, explanation of uh, this new platform. It doesn't replace uh, the MPP or cluster on the right. It comes in as a complementary step, uh, especially if you either, number one, need to get your paper out quickly, which is always the case, or number two, 
you need you get your product out quickly, and you can't wait for that uh, transition to the production code on the right. Uh, and uh, just incidentally, um, when he ported, just moved the code, and the, the neat thing about uh, this, this step is that all he did was just move the code over to the big machine because it's just a big PC, recompiled, and he now has much more memory than he had before to run at scale of the two billion grid points. Sometimes you don't even need to move the code and recompile. You just can take the binary from here, right, and move it across, right, at scale. Because it's the same uh, Intel Xeon processors on this and here. Just that this one has much more memory. Uh, incidentally, uh, for this particular example, uh, the 1.2 terabyte memory he had on this big PC in the middle of that picture, here, 1.2 terabytes uh, he had, right, had 768 cores, and uh, it needed two weeks of runtime uh, to simulate one heartbeat. Well, it is slow because uh, you, you didn't multi-thread it as well. Uh, all you used was the 1.2 terabytes of memory to verify your, your experiment. Uh, but at least it's still faster than probably a month uh, that would have taken to, to complete the MPI port and validate it. So he got his paper out, and it was a very successful paper. Um, I'll have to confirm with Mark uh, as to the precise uh, process uh, it took, but I uh, had some uh, poetic license here to explain uh, how uh, that big memory system made the difference. Yeah. Um, as another side note, I was very excited, right? If you could grow this core count to big enough to bring down the two weeks to uh, a tenth of a second or a fiftieth of a second, you, we actually can get a, a two billion grid point human heart beating in uh, 32 racks of computers, right? And then you can actually manipulate that digital heart as you would a, a real human heart, yeah. Uh, the amazing thing is we're almost there, right? I think uh, give us another few years, we will have a full 2 billion grid point digital heart that has very close ECG representation to a hu human measured ECG on the surface of the heart uh, beating in 32 racks, racks of computer. Yeah. But by that time, you probably want more grid points. Yeah. Anyway. So let me now generalize from that example uh, to, a, to a more generic data set. If you just simply wanted to build a data set in engineering, in science, in biology, in physics, uh, where your x-axis has 1,000 grid points, and then your y-axis has another 1,000 grid points, and your z-axis has another 1,000 grid points, that makes a billion. And then you want to march that whole cube 1,000 time steps. Uh, that's 1 trillion grid points. And if you just casually say, I would like uh, a single precision number for each of those grid points, and that's an 8 terabyte data set. That seems like a, a, a very casual request, uh, but uh, there is no computer in the world that will allow you to write this program, right? Not unless uh, you have something like uh, that at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Let me see if that system is up. It's uh, currently on maintenance. Let me see if it's not up. What I'll do is uh, show you a video recording of it. Yeah, it's not up. Let me show you a video recording of that system. So upcoming here is a PC that I've logged in into the TerraGrid. There's a TerraGrid system here. And I'm going to run that video. Here it says uh, uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. I've logged in and asked, how much memory do you have? Yeah. It says, I currently have kilobyte, <coughs> megabyte, gigabyte, and terabytes of memory. So basically, this PC at Pittsburgh has 16 terabytes of memory. Um, and true shared 16 terabytes of memory. Yeah, it costs a bit more than a normal PC, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jim can tell you. All right. uh, and, and ask it how much uh, CPU it has. It has 4,096 CPUs in that PC. right? Uh, really has only 2,000, but because hyper-threading uh, with the Xeons, Intel Xeon, it doubles it. Now I'm going to call up uh, a big, uh, th that code. Remember that code I mentioned that has uh, 1,000 grid points uh, in the X direction, 1,000 grid points in the Y, 1,000 grid points in the Z direction, and 1,000 grid points in time steps. So this is a trillion point data set 
and I uh, asked for it to be an integer, which is uh, a four byte. I, I was easy on the machine here. I didn't ask for a long four byte. So this is a four terabyte data set. And uh, I'm just gonna show you what we did here. Yeah. yeah, so it compiled well. Intel compiler worked. So yeah, that's the first thing, right? Try this on your laptop. Yeah. Uh, CC minus O3 compile this code. There is a eight terabyte, a four terabyte in size. Uh, the bigger one is uh, whether we have the guts to run it. Yeah. Yeah, it ran, and then you can see it eating memory on the top here. Yeah. yeah. That was a time where Pittsburgh called me out on my cell phone and complained. Yeah. It, uh, it was eating up lots of memory there. Yeah. Yeah. You can see it eating up the memory. It's just a dummy program, but uh, you know, it goes ahead. And it works, yeah. And of course, uh, in your case, uh, you'll be putting in all your physics and chemistry and engineering uh, codes in the middle here, in the loop, right, to do your work. But basically, this code works, yeah. Straight off, yeah. I did not do anything. I just wrote the code, and it worked, yeah. right? Uh, I think uh, very soon, I've, I've eaten up a terabyte now, but uh, very soon I did a control C. You can see I, uh, the system recovers all that memory quickly. It's shrinking right now, you can see, yeah. Okay, right. So that's basically uh, what we have. And this is that machine. It is 4x in size using uh, four gigab uh, eight gigabyte DIMMs, uh, uh, four gigabyte DIMMs, and then you'll be only two racks uh, if you use eight gigabyte DIMMs, and one rack 16 gig with 16 gigabyte DIMMs, yeah. So essentially it is a PC with 2,000 co physical cores and 16 terabytes of memory. I thought I, I bring up another example to show you how you would use such a system. I've, I've gone to a smaller scale system here, right? Uh, not with uh, 16 terabytes and 2,000 cores, just to run some experiments. This system uh, is plugged with an NVIDIA graphics card, and we booted it. And it has uh, one socket with all its cores here and its memory. Another socket, Intel socket, with all its cores lined up here and its memory. Another socket with all its cores and its memory. And this, this vertical bar uh, down here, when it goes up, will show you the total memory used up by all, uh, total me memory added up uh, by adding up all these memories on the socket. So I'm just going to run that same code again, albeit at a smaller scale, and show you how uh, one would use such a system. <coughs> right. So I have a code, uh, very easy code, right? Same thing, x 1000 grid points, y 1000, z 1000, and then to make it easy on this smaller system, I put the t as only 100 grid points, not 1000, right? Mm -hmm. So now I compile it. Right? And then I run it. Basically, I ran it single threaded. So one core is used on this socket, and then that core is now eating up memory on that socket. You can see it growing. And that shows you the total. Right? And then when this core uses up uh, the memory on its socket, it will start to eat up because it needs more, right? It starts to eat up uh, memory on its neighboring socket automatically. Right? And then when this finishes, it should eat up another socket depending on how the cable connects uh, the different uh, sockets together. Now it's eating up this, this neighboring one. So there is a locality in the way it eats memory. And then if you want to run it in parallel, it recovers, a1.c. Now I just add in another line, uh, openMP, right, on top of the loop to make it run in parallel. And then I'll just uh, complete this demo by showing you uh, how I would just run it. F open MP, excuse me. A1.c. And then when I run it, guess what happens? It goes out and says, oh, I'm going to eat up all the memory in the system, right? Uh, actually, it's been set to 16 threads. So, so all the uh, cores are used, right? Some of them are not used because I've set it to 16. Let me. Uh, Set it to a higher number. Yeah. Export uh, open MP. Equal 
equals uh, 64, say. Okay? So now I run it. Yeah. So you can see now, uh, all you do is add one line to make it run in parallel, and all the cores are now used uh, to consume all that memory. Yeah. And you can see the memory is eating, eaten up much faster because now you have many more threads uh, eating that memory. Yeah. So that's basically what we have. Uh, we have demonstrated very quickly uh, this system, right? Albeit that the one with graphics is a smaller scale one. Easy to use, works just like a PC, just that it has more uh, 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 memory and more uh, processors. Yeah. How does it work? If you take one of those racks, you open up the rack door, you get a blade. And this is just a, a standard PC blade with two uh, Intel processors, Xeons. And what we do differently is add one chip here, which is the uh, UV chip. And every blade in the, these slots, yeah, each of them, will have one of these chips. And this chip is, just, uh, is there to take care in hardware to fuse all the memory in all the blades into one big piece, making 16 terabytes for you. Right? And the, the one could say the magic is all in that chip uh, that took us uh, eight years to build. Yeah. And finally, it's here. And uh, we have now shipped about 200 systems of such. Yeah. If you want to look at that blade uh, life, uh, this is that blade. And I'm pointing to below this, uh, this. I'm pointing to that chip that we built, and below this are the two Intel processors. Yeah. Right. And then we connect this to our backplane, and away we go. These are the customers. There are about 90 systems with a terabyte or more. Um, these are the unclassified ones, of course. Um, and then you can see Pittsburgh has two of such systems, and the rest around the world. The interesting thing to note is that there are many. Uh, uh, biology type uh, uh, customers, the genome, CVS, uh, uh, which is also a bioinformatics uh, customer, genome analysis, Institute of Cancer Research in the UK, uh, SESCA in Spain also is a genomic, Nova Nordis and so on. And then, uh, so there is a growth uh, in users other than physics and chemistry type customers, uh, the growth in biology also. I guess mainly because they are dealing with uh, a lot of data and they would like to look at the data in a global way. Yeah. So to, to sum up uh, what this system is, uh, if one were to look at a MacBook Air uh, that has two Intel cores, uh, four gigabytes of memory, and one instance on a Mac OS, uh, the Altex UV uh, it, it has 2,000 cores, 16 terabytes, and one instance of a standard Linux, and that's called a Big Mac, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can't trade market yet. Yeah. Have to talk to McDonald's and Apple. Right? Yes. <laughs> now, if you look at uh, Windows, uh, what happens then if you load the Windows on this machine, other than Linux? It's a PC, right? You should be able to load Windows, yeah? As you should be able to load Solaris. Um, let's look at my laptop first, yeah? Where's, which is a Windows 7 uh, operating system laptop. If, if I call up my laptop and, uh, and ask uh, for a... Uh, Control, alternate, delete, I think, for task manager. You will notice that my laptop right, has four windows when you call up task manager. One, two, three, four, to represent the four cores that I have on my laptop. So have you wondered uh, if we loaded windows on that UV, will we break windows? Right? <laughs> we actually did uh, load it. and. And this was the result. There were, it worked, yeah? Credit to, to Microsoft. Yeah, it came up. Albeit that uh, there are 16 by 16 windows, so there are 256 cores or threads. Uh, it's just that the Windows Server R8 uh, 2008 today has a limit of 256 threads. We maxed it out. Yeah, if you look at the arrow there, it shows one, two terabytes of memory. We maxed it out. So. Uh, there are a few interesting things here. Ne things like this have never been done before because no one has such a big platform to push such limits. Uh, and we were so interesting. One day, uh, you know, Oracle came with a USB stick plugged in onto this big PC, and, uh, and suddenly Solaris came up. Yeah. Right? And Microsoft came over, uh, put in the CD for uh, Windows Server, and suddenly it came up, and they were very pleased that uh, they did write their Windows Task Manager properly, and it worked. Yeah. So it became a, a strong test platform for both Oracle and, uh, and Microsoft. 
So to just uh, complete this uh, process, you, you now uh, understand now that uh, right, there is this additional platform that provides you an option today. It does not replace uh, the cluster or MPP system that ultimately you need to go to for production, but it now gives you an option to move quickly to scale up uh, your code. Most likely to scale up in memory first, because that's easiest, very little changes. And if you want it to do multi-threaded OpenMP, you may have to do a little bit more work. But for these scientists, their goal is just to quickly get their up, uh, at scale results up so that they can run, uh, continue with their uh, research work or get to production quickly. Now to put everything on a, a scale line, quarter terabyte, half terabyte, one terabyte, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64 terabyte. A typical PC or a node in your cluster is typically about uh, 100 gigabytes. Yeah, so I put it there between a quarter terabyte to half terabyte. Yeah? Or the 100 gigabyte per PC, per workstation, or per node in your cluster, if you really uh, increase the, the, that node to maximum memory. I just put it there. Um, the current uh, Intel Nihalem core microarchitecture uh, limits uh, can only see 16 terabytes. That's why you see that number 16. Because we need every Intel processor to see all the memory. So you, we need that Intel processor to be capable enough to see all the memory in the system, and it has 44 bit of physical address. That's why it's limited to 16 terabyte. We've worked with Intel uh, to scale that. I'll come to that soon. That's the physical limit on the top, and at the bottom is today's Windows limit. We've tested Windows Server uh, uh, 2008 release to SP1 to two terabytes of memory. Uh, we are now currently working with uh, uh, Microsoft to scale that higher. They have to increase the, the limits they have placed inside Windows. Uh, we have uh, Linux release 6 SP1 in May that we will certify at 8 terabyte. It has to be up to us to, to certify it because there's no other platform to certify uh, Linux to that scale. And of course, uh, Celeste 11 today scales to the full 16 terabytes of Intel. This is what we release. But we are starting to get a lot of sales in the government for this. Uh, we have a six terabyte sa sale recently, and coming up an eight terabyte sale. So we we definitely have to scale uh, Red Hat uh, to these limits. Yeah, Red Hat has no other platform to to test this, right? It has to test it on this platform because this is the only one around. Interestingly, though, uh, we have been receiving requests uh, from the government to scale beyond sixteen terabytes, and this is where we need help from Intel, and they came through. In a few months, the Intel Sandy Bridge will be 64 terabyte, and we already have one order. Yeah. And we have to tell them to wait, uh, uh, because our own uh, hub chip is not ready. Uh, but I thought this, this slide would be useful to give you some insights as to how people are starting to realize there could be a different way of running your laboratory, right? or a complementary way uh, to enhance your productivity of your, uh, of your science, of your engineering. Or if you have a huge data problem resulting from exascale, how can the data be analyzed effectively on a global scale uh, with something like this? So this needs a new way of thinking. We have a fixed set of users that knew exactly what they could do with this machine when we released it. But I think there is yet a huge set, other set that uh, we need your help in, in looking at this to see how you could use this in new ways. Basically, how to use this middle piece in new ways. And to complete uh, the packaging site, uh, you can see that, uh, again, you have a rack with many blade slots, and one of these blades has one of our chips in it. Uh, we've got so much request that uh, there was uh, one customer, uh, we won't name, but we can only show a picture, that thought that even though this gave them a very good convenience, they have actually stopped porting their code over to a cluster and just used this as their deployed platform. Why? Because they need to get their products out to the government quickly, and the development time is taking too long, and they could deploy the systems uh, in half the time, albeit that this system will cost more than if they had ported it to a cluster. But then they save the money in not doing the port, and also they save the money in not having to wait another six months before they can deliver the product uh, to the government. And this customer uh, of ours, which is an integrator, has actually decided not only to use this as a bigger laboratory, uh, but also to use this as a deployed platform. As such, uh, this customer has asked for uh, the system to be ruggedized, and we have. 
to be used for mobile deployments. Yeah. Yet to expand uh, this new way of thinking. Yeah. And to close off, uh, keep in mind here, oh, this can also be very useful for exascale analytics. I mean this. In high performance computing, we've been going towards exascale. Right? Today, we are of the order of 100,000 cores commonly with about 100 terabytes of memory in a cluster. Soon, we'll be moving to a million cores with a petabyte of memory in a cluster. And soon, at exascale, perhaps we may have to go to 10 million cores with 10 petabytes of memory in a cluster. Complementing this exascale system needs to be front-end analytic system. In the early days, we had a PC with 12 cores and 8 gigabytes of memory. To, to download a subset of that result uh, to try and look at it in a global way. Either that, or you break the resulting data up into pieces and run it as a cluster again. So you do a cluster twice, right? You not only cluster to MPI cluster your HPC code, you, after producing the data, you then have to MPI cluster the output data in order to run it on a cluster. That's, that's the problem, right? Uh, so what people do is try to squeeze it into a PC. A workstation or a uh, cluster node has grown up to about half a terabyte of memory. And what we really need for exascale uh, is a complementary system as a front end uh, to this exascale system that will have 64 terabytes of memory, uh, at least that will carry us all the way to the year 2014, uh, with, at which time we try and work with Intel again to increase this number. <laughs> On that note, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, today it will give you some insight uh, into a new discovery platform that is complementary. Yeah, we sell the entire range, right? So we don't mean uh, to say that the cluster is not relevant here. No, absolutely it's fully relevant because many codes will still need a cluster or MPP system. But think of this as a complementary platform now that will enhance uh, your scientific and engineering productivity. If you need uh, more details, uh, either go to the URL on top, which is pretty complex, uh, or go to Google and just search on these four keywords, and the video that gives you more details will come up. Yeah? And on this note, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.